It often happens when I speak Italian in a public space in the US, over the phone or with family, friends or guests, that someone starts a casual conversation with me. My ancestors are from, followed by the name of an obscure or mispronounced village somewhere in Italy, or I was in Italy, followed by the report of a fabulous grand tour to Venice, Florence and Rome. In spite of their cliches, these conversations are actually always surprising. One point where they all seem to end up is particularly revealing to me. It's kind of a refrain. Italy, oh, the food was so good. I have no issues with it, but as far as I'm concerned, despite many myths, there are lots of places in America where you can actually eat very well. This being said, and I confess I rarely follow up on this with complete strangers, one question remains. Why, in hearing Italian, is food often the first mental association? Why is Italian food immediately related to exceptionality? Sure, there is something about the authenticity and genuineness of ingredients, which are less processed, or about the eating habits, more convivial and less solitary or rapid, or the overall scenario, a villa or a marvelous coastline, that captures our attention in Italian food. But what is the recipe of its success? What makes Italian cooking so immediately recognizable? What culture does it spring from? What culture does it generate? I'll focus on two elements in dealing with this. It's incredible diversity. Every city, every region has its own typical recipes. And it's unique porosity, that is, that is its capacity to embrace, include, and reinvent ingredients, currents, and trends coming from very heterogeneous sources. I'll start from porosity. So Italian cuisine is often identified with the so-called Mediterranean diet. This diet was formalized as a concept by the fascist regime in the 1930s as a way to promote tourism to the southern regions of Italy. But its roots extend to a much longer history. In its broader sense, the word Mediterranean, which literally means in the middle of lands, already implies a crossroads of words, tastes, and influences. Italian cuisine absorbs their key ingredients in a porous synthesis. While the ancient Roman diet, based on their cultivation of grain, oil, and grapes, revolved around bread, oil, and wine. Meats and dairy came later from barbaric or nomadic cultures, focused on hunting and sheep farming. The medieval diet included the Roman heritage because of its connection with the Christian elements of bread and wine, but also embraced Arab and Oriental influences, so spices and pasta. The report by Marco Polo that pasta originated in China is not entirely accurate. The idea of a dough made of flour and water, impasto, from which we get the word pasta, was already present in the ancient world, and the Arabs in Sicily introduced the idea of dry pasta for longer conservation. The discovery of the new world further enriched the diet with a new set of ingredients, like tomatoes, which are now paradoxically a symbol of Italy, like potatoes and beans. We can say then that Italian food mirrors Italy's history as a hybrid platform of inclusion, synthesis, and recreation of cultures. Along with its porosity, the other distinctive element of the Italian culture of food is its diversity, which is expressed in a clear bond with local traditions and territories. Food in Italy is indeed a marker of specific cultural identities. Pecorino, then, is not just sheep cheese, 
but is always connoted as Sardo, Romano, Toscano, so from Sardinia, Rome, Tuscany. Now, why is this bond important? To understand this, we have to go back to how 19th century industrialization completely changed our relationship to food. How? Well, first of all, the creation of a transportation network and the invention of refrigeration broke the traditional idea of a diet based on local cultivations, bringing to the table instead ingredients from all over the world. Now, we often fail to realize it, but the food that we eat has traveled thousands of miles before arriving on our plates. Salmon from Alaska, sugar from Hawaii, coffee beans from Brazil, olive oil from Italy, and so on. In addition to the deterritorialization of food, its mass production has also been a major factor in the standardization of tastes around new models of conservation and distribution. Canned meat, or spam, was created for American soldiers during World War II, and grocery stores have actually made it possible to create eating patterns by disarticulating food from its source. So if you buy chicken wings, you're not consuming an actual chicken, but rather the disjointed parts of several chickens. Now, against this backdrop, Italy's cherished liaison of food and territory certainly represents an important factor of diversity because of genuineness in production, but also because of the Italian link between consumption and lifestyle, between eating and a way of living. Eating, for Italians, is not just eating, but rather something that creates meaning. This is where the food was so good becomes a relevant observation. It was good to consume, yes, but it also contained something that entailed a different, attractive approach to life. This is also where the work of Italy's top chef, Massimo Bottura, our innovator for today, becomes relevant. In the work of Bottura, cuisine becomes a powerful synthesis of Italy's diverse and porous culinary landscape. What I find fascinating about him is that cooking does not relate to a nostalgic effort to maintain traditions, but rather turns into an experimental platform for the development of new languages. Here is Bottura himself confirming this in the introduction to his Master Chef class. We never look at the past in a nostalgic way. We look at the past in a critic way to get the best from the past into the future. Now, how do you talk about a guy like Bottura, whose Michelin three-star restaurant, Osteria Francescana, has been voted the top restaurant in the world in 2016 and 2018 by the world's 50 best restaurants? How do you even start talking about a top global chef who grew up in Italy, in Modena, worked in New York, developed the idea of a molecular cuisine in Barcelona, and received an honorary degree from the University of Bologna? We could certainly talk about his alternative method of preparing foods based on gelatins, foams, and chemical reactions, the so-called molecular cuisine. And we could even spend some time there but with Bottura, the situation is more complex than that. With him, we're actually dealing with someone who purposely turns food into an art form in its design, processes, combinations, and connections to other media. In this light, then, rather than analyzing Bottura's techniques, I will focus instead on his philosophy of cooking as both a living synthesis of the Italian landscape and a platform for the creation of knowledge. Yes, knowledge. In Italian, the word sapere, to know, is actually the same word as sapere, to savor. To know, in fact, is to enjoy. Now, what do we know in cooking? This is the question for Bottura. Eating is not only about feeding the stomach, but also the intellect, the emotions, the heart, 
and the spirit too, if you want. And the palate, where we savor the taste of things, is not the site of consumption, but actually the place of memory, associations, of a knowledge rooted in experience. Along these lines, we can understand why cooking for Bottura is an art of cultural synthesis, imaginative combination, and creative reinvention. Along these lines, we can understand Bottura's idea of tradition in evolution. His approach to cuisine, in fact, is not concerned with cherishing old classic recipes, but rather with making them happen again, improving them, and bringing them into the future. In tradition, Bottura is not searching for an immobile repertoire of solutions to be boxed up and neutralized forever, but rather the hidden forces that make it alive. His idea of tradition is thus related to the notion of the unexpected. If you're familiar with the Italian modernist painter Giorgio Morandi, who worked in still lives in the early 20th century, portraying bottles in various shapes and visual architectures, you might see my point. Bottura, like Morandi, is in search of an element of slight variation, which opens up an unexplored path. How do you design a new bottle when the form is pretty much set? How do you prepare new Italian food within an established culinary tradition? Cooking for Bottura thus implies the zeal to look at ingredients from a distance, from 10 kilometers away, in his own words, to discover a variable in them, to see them as a surprise, to risk new combinations. In this sense, if art and culture open up a broader space of creativity to cooking, leftovers are key variables for inventing new paths and solutions. This is truly an obsession for Bottura and a key Italian trait of his work. Don't throw anything away, he often states. You can use everything and make it even better. We'll talk more about this at the end of the episode. Now, from these observations, you can see that culture is an essential part of Bottura's success. If you open the webpage of his restaurant, Osteria Francescana, the initial quote will confirm this even more. Here it is. Our kitchen is not a list of ingredients or demonstration of technical abilities. It is a narration of the Italian landscape and our passions. Cooking is a collision of ideas, techniques, and cultures. It is not mathematical. It is emotional." End quote. If you really need further proof that for Bottura, food is about a surprising dialogue with the natural landscape, with, with the visual arts that compose the setup of his restaurant, with history and tradition, that food is a narration, just read his menu. And I quote here some of the items. Eel swimming up the Po River. Five ages of Parmigiano Reggiano in different textures and temperatures. The singular interpretation of filet alla Rossini with foie gras and caviar. Or lastly, this little piggy went to market. Bottura's ability to see Italian culinary traditions from a distance allows him not only to detect in it its lively sources, the awe for its quality and the obsession with its flavors, but also to place his new creations within a broader landscape of ideas. One product in particular mirrors this philosophy, and that is the Parmigiano Reggiano, a cheese whose quality grows with time, like the best stories, whose parts are all for use, even the rind, but also a cheese which is both about perfection, the real obsession of the chef prior to profit, and about surprise, especially at the moment of the opening of a wheel when all its flavor is unleashed. Not by chance, 
one of Bottura's top dishes is actually the five ages of Parmigiano Reggiano, a fluffy souffle served with a Parmesan crisp and topped with an air made from the crust of a 40-month-old Parmigiano Reggiano wheel, melt-in-your-mouth foam and a light Parmigiano Reggiano cream. Other top dishes that made him famous? Well, the tortellini walking in broth, the foam of mortadella sandwich, the psychedelic veal not grilled, and in terms of dessert, the iconic, oops, I dropped the lemon tart. As a last consideration, let me add a corollary here about something truly remarkable in Bottura's approach to cuisine. I'm referring here to the experience of the so-called Refettorio Ambrosiano, Ambrosian Refectory, that he launched in 2015 in the context of the Milan Expo. After turning an old theater into a community soup kitchen, he invited 60 top chefs to cook leftover ingredients for the poor, so that guests, in his own words, could feed both their body and soul, end quote. As you can imagine, the refettorio was not about second-rate food, but rather constituted an experimental laboratory for the development of new ideas. At the same time, it was not about the mere necessity to feed and be fed, or the charity to, go, to do good, but rather about creating an experience filled with meaning. The refettorio thus exemplified the passage from need to a desire embodying around cooking a common tension toward beauty that we all crave, even in the most material things. This is how cooking becomes culture, how a material need turns into an intellectual quest. The experience of the Ambrosian Refectory became the base of Bottura's 2017 book entitled Bread is Gold. Extraordinary Meals with Ordinary Ingredients, which collected contributions by the chefs who participated in the project and provides tips on how to turn would-be discarded ingredients into delicious meals. So how to use ugly basil with breadcrumbs to reinvent pesto in the absence of pine nuts. I often repeat it for Italian cuisine, design and tailoring. The Italian genius is about the creative use of the leftover. There is nothing that is more at the center of the Italian recipe for success than the experience of limit as a source of endless imagination. It's the same experience crystallizing the memory of every Italian of the young romantic poet Giacomo Leopardi, who in his most famous poem, L'Infinito, Infinity in 1819, saw the obstacle of a hedgerow blocking the vision of the landscape as a creative limit, exciting his imagination to think of endless spaces and profound quiet behind it. For Bottura, he was imagining beyond the visible, what's inside an ingredient, what's beyond its traditional use, what's the broadest horizon of food that became the recipe for an incredible Italian stretch of imagination, and thus of innovation and success. Time for Italian now. Massimo Bottura è lo chef italiano più famoso al mondo. Cucinare, per lui, è una arte misteriosa di tradizione, ambizione e innovazione. Il suo successo nasce dalla capacità di riimmaginare la cucina tradizionale italiana, di elaborare nuove combinazioni di ingredienti, di inventare nuove tecniche e di costruire il gesto di mangiare come un gesto profondamente umano e culturale. Thank you very much for listening and don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Luca Cottini or ITA Innovators for updates, additional contents and much more. Arrivederci e alla prossima.